Okay, so I believe we left off on phase diagrams. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, basically phase diagrams are, um, are just diagrams that lets us know where those phases take place. And uh, it's in relationship to pressure and temperature. So like, for instance, if you take a look at the phase diagram that's shown below, um, you have the triple point. Triple point is the point where um, you have all three states. So you have solid, liquid, and gas. Let me see, hold on. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. This line here, this represents the, uh, particularly from here to here, this represents the transitional phase from solid to liquid. And so if we're going from solid to liquid, that's melting. If we're going from liquid to solid, that's freezing. This line here represents the transition from gas, uh, liquid to gas, and vaporization, going from liquid to gas, condensation, going from gas to uh, liquid. And uh, the line down here represents the transition from solid to gas. OK, questions? Okay, so now let's think about in terms of energy, right? Um, if energy is being absorbed, right, or energy is being put into the system, then that's, is that endothermic or exothermic? Endo, right? It's endo, yeah. Okay, so if uh, energy is being put into the system, So are you are you going to be breaking? Or are those are they going to be used to be breaking bonds? Or are they going to be used to uh, or not bonds? Breaking those forces or be used to uh, increase the forces? Let's say breaking because you're okay. putting energy. That's right. So if we're putting energy into the system, we're going to be breaking some of those forces, right? And so so. Uh, in the case of your phase diagram, you could do this two ways. One, we could do it by heat, by the addition of heat, um, or we could do it do it by pressure, right? So if we increase the pressure on things, we could also um, cause that transition as well. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so use the phase diagram for water um, given in figure 1031 to determine the state of water at the temperature and pressure. Okay, uh, let's see, A, minus 10 degrees and 50 degrees. I mean, minus 10 degrees and 50 uh, kilopascals. So I'll do the first one and then I'm gonna expect you guys to kind of participate on the rest. So if it's minus 10, minus 10 degrees, so here's zero degrees, so it's somewhere in this realm, okay? And it's all the way up to 50 pascals, so about right here. So then the state is gonna be a solid. Okay, does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Okay. Hey, Kayla, since you really want an answer, you can do B. Okay. Um, let's see. 25 Celsius, 90 Pascals. Mm. Abby, you get to do C. Selena. You get to do D and uh, Matt, you get to do E and who else is here?
and we'll let Jessica do F. Okay, so what did you get for uh, B, Kayla? Uh, I would say um, liquid water okay. or liquid. 25 degrees, maybe right here, and 90. Yeah. Okay, so that, I would definitely say that would be water. Abby, 50 degrees and 40 uh, kilopascals. That one I would have to say would be water liquid as well okay that is correct okay uh let's see uh matt did i give you d or e i can't remember i'm old oh you give me e okay so then selena d um Okay, type it in the uh, chat. Sorry, my, my right. audio was really weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's between the gas or the liquid because it's five kilopascals. Okay, so it'll be somewhere down here. Yeah, somewhere there. Okay. And it's 80 degrees Celsius? Yes. So what does it look like it would be? Guess. OK. Matt? Um, I would say solid. OK. And Jessica? Would it be water vapor? Gas? Gas? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Piece of cake? Sample? Yep. Okay. Good. So there's also what we call the, the critical point. The critical point is the point where your, your gas phase and your water phase kind of disappear. So it's kind of like it becomes a mixture of both, sort of. Okay. And, uh, So it forms what we call a super critical fluid. And, and the thing about super critical fluids is that they have characteristics, some of the characteristics of gases, and then they have some of the characteristics of liquids. So like for instance, uh, like a gas is able to expand and fill containers, its density is gonna be kind of closer to the gas than it is gonna be to the liquid. It's going to exhibit no surface tension and low viscosity. So they can be used to dissolve solvents, and they're great at penetrating things that have very small openings, right? So you can use the fact that they're able to penetrate things that have small openings to help dissolve things and get them out. And so in industry, like if you're trying to make decaffeinated coffee beans, what you can do is you can use uh, carbon dioxide at, in a supercritical fluid state and use that to sit there and extract the caffeine out. And so you get a twofer in that case. You get the coffee beans that are decaffeinated and then you get the caffeine that can be added onto some other product. Okay, make sense? And so this, is playing on the fact that carb, uh, carbon dioxide is, uh, is nonpolar and it's using those dispersionary forces and it's actually interacting with uh, the caffeine molecule with those dispersionary forces. Okay. Questions? Concerns? Cash? Okay. Oops. 
Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about are the solid state of matter. So, uh, solids have two types of structures. One is organized, the crystalline structure, and one is called amorphous, meaning that it lacks structure. Okay, um, and you can kind of see crystalline structure. It's all organized, has a nice orderly pattern associated with it. The amorphous structure doesn't. Okay, so here, uh, this is an example of silicon uh, dioxide. So in one case, uh, when it's naturally occurring and things like that, it has plenty of time to cool and it's not rapidly cooled or anything to that extent, it has a nice organized pattern. You can see that. In here. But in the case of rapidly cooled, uh, silica dioxide, uh, it actually forms an amorphous structure. So it loses some of that order, okay? So you can kind of see the difference between it, one well-organized and one losing the shape that it was supposed to have. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so this is gonna be kind of important for you know that concept of rapid cooling, right? So we often use, we use rapid cooling to sit there and make certain metals. Because of that, we can also cause uh, imperfections. And we'll kind of talk about some of those imperfections that are, can occur because we don't get, we form those amorphous shapes or we could end up with vacancies or, or things like that in the structure itself. So um, the types of solids, we have ionic solids. Ionic solids, you guys know what ionic is. It basically uses cation and the anion plus and the minus charges and they're held together by electrostatic forces. They're hard, they're brittle, um, they have high melting uh, points. They don't conduct electricity but when they're uh, but they can when they're they're molten, basically they're melted or dissolved, dissolved in like solutions. So for instance, sodium chloride is an example of an ionic uh, solid. Okay, we have metallic solids. Metallic solids primarily form crystalline structures. Um, so if you guys remember when we talked about that bond, the metallic bond, we talked about the metallic bond in this class, right? Sea of electrons. Mm, I don't know. Don't recall. Delina, do we talk about metallic bonds? Um, we touched on it. <laughs> There's not much to say. It's just, remember, if it's like sodium, sodium has one valence electron. So what it'll do, it'll drop that electron right next to it. And then it'll act as if it's a positively charged molecule, right? And then the electron acts as if it's the negatively charged molecule. And they interact that way. So that's basically their, their, uh, their interaction. So you'll have like, let's say sodium plus, and then the electron will be next to it. And then the other one will be sodium plus, and the electron next to it. And so these electrons, they kind of form what they call a sea of delocalized electrons. And they basically interact with those positively charged so that they form that connection and they keep, they're held together that way. Now, because the way that they're established with those, that positive and then the sea of electrons, they're really good at conducting that thermal energy and they're really good at conducting electric, uh, electric, uh, electric energy, right? Okay, because, um, or electricity, um, because of those charges, they're, they're free to sit there and roam the way that they need to roam. And so, you know, that's the reason why we use wire, you know, copper wire for, for um, proper nickel wire for transmitting um, electricity into our, our lights and all those things, right? And then that's also the reason why we use metal for cooking, right? Because they're great at, at transferring heat as well, or conducting heat. Okay, so metals have a metallic luster. 
They're malleable. They vary in strength. We have, uh, and they also will vary in uh, melting temperature. So for instance, if we have gold compared to steel or iron, right? So gold is a lot more malleable, it's flexible, it's not as strong as iron is. And then in terms of the melting temperature, we have mercury, which is a liquid at room temperature, where iron is a solid at room temperature. So that shows you the, the drasticness of that, you know, the variability. So we have covalent network of solids um, or covalent network of solids. The prime example of this is the diamond. Uh, so basically diamond is just carbon. It's the carbon molecule and you just have units of carbon that are that are covalently connected to each other, right? Carbon, 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 is completely connected to each other. Okay, now these guys are relatively strong. They are often, uh, they have hardness, they have strength, and they have very high melting temperatures, right? So you've never heard of a diamond melting, have you? No. Mm -mm. Okay. So um, I want to kind of, and I'll probably point this out later. Remember my slides. Um, so in the case of a diamond, diamond is just basically carbon, right? And uh, graphite, lead pencils, graphite is also a carbon. The distinction is the organization of of the two carbon structures, where diamond has more of the uh, like tripod looking type of organization, where graphite is made in sheets. And so graphite, when we write on a piece of paper, we're leaving bits of graphite because we're removing sheets of graphite onto the paper and leaving those there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So. We also know that graphite is relatively uh, soft and, uh, and it has a little bit of electroconductivity. And that's primarily because of the gaps between it and how the sheets are, are formed, okay? Okay. So the other type is uh, molecular solids. Molecular solids are going to be neutral molecules. They're going to be held together primarily on uh, intermolecular forces. Uh, their strength are also going to vary depending on the type of intermolecular forces that they have. So examples of this is ice, water, sucrose, iodine. Um, you guys can kind of see that here. Okay. And to kind of show you the drasticness of their uh, their melting points. So we know that uh, carbon dioxide melts at negative 78 degrees Celsius. So if it goes uh, above that, it melts, okay? And then um, iodine, on the other hand, uh, is gonna melt at 114 degrees Celsius. Okay. Questions, concerns, cash? Okay. So this is just a, a table that shows you all of the, the properties of, um, of the different types of solids. Okay. Now, we've actually have made uh, drastic amount of improvements over time. And um, using some of the properties of, of the different solids, we said they're able to make things a lot stronger. So we're able to like dope um, steel so that it actually is a little more 
firmer and stronger and it doesn't uh, fracture as much as it, it would normally do on its own. Uh, we've made nanopar uh, nanoparticles, nanotubes, things to that extent. And a lot of this has been done over the last, uh, last few years or last um, half century. We've made major progress in terms of materials that we've developed. And so this basically is just kind of showing you that. So uh, we have what we call the buckyball. So we have uh, graphenin. Graphenin is basically um, carbon, a carbon structure that has carbon ring-like structure. So, so this would be like the base unit. And so there's one, two, three, four, five, six carbons that are gonna be attached covalently. And then they're all covalently attached to each other. So the buckyball, um, it's basically like a, looks like a soccer ball that has only carbons attached to it. And then each of these carbons have double bonds, double bond here, double bond here, double bond there, and then single bonds between the alternating, okay? Uh, these guys can basically be used to make nanotubes. They could be used to make sheets. And so a lot of these things are gonna be used in industry and are currently being used in industry, okay? So, as I mentioned, there's also crystalline defects. So the defects, um, the, there are three major types of defects. We have vacancies. Vacancies are basically holes um, in the, the lattice. And so you basically, instead of, if we had metal there, your metal ion, um, your metal um, atom is missing. And so you just have an empty spot there. We have, um, uh, substitution uh, impurity. And so a substitution impurity basically means that you're adding something that doesn't so supposed to be there, that is not normally there. So instead of having, let's say, this is the lattice of sodium, instead of that we have, or this is the lattice of lithium, you add a sodium there, right? Sodium is smaller, it goes in there, it'll be able to fit in there without a problem, right? We could also have a substitution where we have a bigger molecule. So instead of of uh, sodium here, we could have, um, let's say, francium, right, which is much bigger. And so then that causes the, um, the lattice to kind of bow and causing another type of defect, okay? And then we have interstitial, interstitial impurities. Interstitial impurities basically um, are when atoms or molecules or ions basically go in between that lattice. So the gaps in between the lines. Okay. And so these guys, you know, they are often used for either A, um, strengthening, or they can be used, uh, well, often they're used for strengthening. They can just be impurities that occur naturally. Okay. So questions on that? You guys got it? Yeah. Okay. So we actually in industry have uh, done things, what we intentionally put in substitutions in there called dopey. Um, so basically you're substituting and you're putting something in there to strengthen the lattice, or we'll put some impurity in there to help strengthen, let's say steel or something like that, like carbon, carbonized steel. Okay. So an example in real life is the silicone chip. So in the case of that, it's been doped. Uh, so basically we have silicone um, and we're doping it with arsenic uh, on, under one circumstances. So that's called an n-type. And so it has one more electron than silicone. So this has an extra electron, right? So negative, okay. Or we can dope it with boron. Boron has one less electron than uh, silicone. And so in this case, we kind of, we call that P-type, kind of like for positive, right? Okay. So, um, and semiconductors, a lot of things use both N-types and P-types, or they'll, they'll use one or the other, okay? They can use combinations of both, or you can use um, others, depending on what you're trying to get across, or trying to get done. Okay, 
Questions, concerns, cash? Credit? Okay, so now I have to go to the blue slides. I apologize. Okay, so um, the next thing that we're going to talk about are the lattice structures and uh, crystalline solids. So, lattice, the lattice structures are basically organized, and they're organized in a way that you form what we call the unit cell. Um, so, the unit cell could either be a, a cube, right? And so, often we call it the, the cubic form. And so, I'll show you. So it'll look something like this, right? And so the cubic unit cell, this is the more, one that's the most commonly and the one that's most commonly known. This unit cell basically uh, has various um, different types of units associated with it. So the simple unit cell is where you have, in this case, atoms at all of the individual points. Of the corners, okay? So that would be a simple cube, okay? Now, and that's kind of shown here. So you basically have atoms at that point. Now, a body center cube is where you have an atom in the center of the cube itself, okay? Now you have atoms on the outside, and then you have an atom in the very center of the cube itself. So basically, this serves as a single unit. And then so you're just making units of this to sit there and make your solid structure. It's all organized. It's going to keep that structure. So you have that one in the middle. And then you have your atoms on the outside. Then we have what we call face center. Face center basically means on every face of the cube, there is an atom. In addition to the the corner atoms. So you have an atom here, you have an atom here, and you have an atom here. Okay. Are you with me? Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So um, this is basically an example of how we would go about calculating. Uh, let's say the the atomic radius um, of of the atom itself using the unit cell. Okay, so in this case, we're assuming that we're working with silver. Silver is uh, going to have a face center um, cube, and so it's going to look like this. And so this cube has a length. Uh, 4.09 times 10 to the minus 10. So in other words, A is going to be equal to that value, right? So if we're using, um, you guys remember in math long, 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 long time ago, where you guys were using the Pythagorean theorem, right? You guys recall that? Okay, so the Pythagorean theorem basically says a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? And so since this is a cube, it's a perfect cube. So then you could say both of your sides are going to be exactly the same. Okay, so they're both going to be the same length. So they're all going to be the same length in that regard. Now, because we're working with a face center cube, we have circle here. So this guy represents that radius, right? And then we have that's the radius here. So that would be a radius of one. This will be 2r. And then this would be r, giving us a total distance of 4r. And that would be our diagonal, right? And so if you guys remember Pat, the Pythagorean theorem, if you have a plus B equals C, that's based upon a right angle, right? A 
B, C, right? So A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So then you plug this in here. Now we said that B is gonna be the exact same size as A because this distance here and that distance there are exactly the same. So we end up with two A squared equals four R squared. So we get A is going to be equal to 8R squared and then R squared is going to be equal to A squared over 8. And then we just take the square root of that. Um, Dr. Henry? Yep. Uh, isn't it 16 of uh, four squared? Yeah, four squared is 16, but we divided it by two. I was cheating. So I should have. Uh, okay. Sorry, I skipped a step. This is why you don't do it all in your head all the time. Okay. Okay, piece of cake. Yes, no, maybe. Maybe. Okay. So if we go back, and let's say we had a simple square, right? So in this case, for a simple square, we have So then our A is going to be, let's go. In that case, our A is just going to be our R, right? So in the case of a simple square, if we have a center, then we'd have to, oops, sorry, um, a body center. Then we'd have to go diagonal towards the center of the of our um, of our cube. Okay, so you want to be aware of the different possibilities. Are you with me? Or did I lose you? I kind of get you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, in real life, we also use um, these crystals to help us determine um, determine size and uh, also determine um, uh, diffraction patterns, okay? And then also determine electron densities and things to that extent, okay? The way that we would do that is by using x-rays. Um, and so if you guys remember, um, we talked about how x-ray is a wave. And so it's gonna either form a constructive interference pattern or destructive interference pattern. Do you guys remember constructive or destructive? What yeah. is constructive? Constructive? Anyone? Uh, Matt, do you remember constructive? Um, not at the top of my head. We're talking about waves, right? 
So we're talking about waves. So two waves are coming together. Is this constructive? Which one of these are constructive? This is wave A, wave B. And what is the result? Would it be the top one? No, this is these are two waves coming together, wave A and wave B coming together. Uh -huh. Okay, so your option is is this. Is this one? Example one or example two. Which one are, are these are constructed? A. Example one or example two? One. Okay, yes. Example one is a construct. It's when the, the peaks on the trust of two waves meet together. So then those waves are going to be added. In. So meaning that they're going to they're going to make a bigger amplitude. Same same frequency, but bigger amplitude. Now, in this case, if two waves come together, this wave and this wave come together, this guy is going to be destructive. Okay. I'm going to use different colors. And destructive would just be a straight line, wouldn't it? That's right. Because they're going to cancel each other out. Okay. Simple? Yeah. Okay. Now, what happens in the case of using um, X-ray uh, diffraction is that you're going to be using these patterns to determine whether or not you the structure of certain molecules. So you can use determine the structure of DNA. It's been used to just determine the structure of proteins like HIV and, and things like that, or proteins, uh, say the HIV protease um, in terms of protein. And then also it's been used to discover uh, determine the, let's say the virus attaching to the cell surface of of, uh, of a human cell, okay? So the way that this actually works is, is that it uses uh, what's called Bragg's diffraction, okay? And so if you look at it, yeah. So, so these are atoms, right? Your wave is going to be your X-ray. Your X-ray is going to be coming in at a certain angle. This represents the angle that the the X-ray is going in. It's going to come and bounce off of the nucleus and then shoot the other way. Right. And so, and it should shoot at the same angle. If that plane is is uh, linear, perfectly linear. It should shoot at the same angle, diffract at the same angle that it came in at. Okay. So now, if this X ray comes in, this wave comes in, and it it's actually going to do exactly the same thing, and leave at the same angle. So we can sit there, since things are in an orderly fashion, we can sit there and determine. The distance between that surface atom and that inner surface atom. Okay. And so we could actually use that's going to represent your D, right? Okay, so that distance here. And so if we we use those angles, we know this angle coming in and this angle coming out, and then this angle coming in and this angle coming out, we know that 
that's going to be added up to the sum, we use that distance, of those angles, or delta right there. Okay, so or I should say it'd have the same angle as these guys over here. Okay, so we set a right angle, so it's perpendicular, and we get a B, and that's going to equal our C, or in this case, our D. So A squared plus B squared equals, in this case, D squared. Okay. So do you guys remember, um, it's been a while. So do you guys remember when you, when you were determining the angle, like sine of, of theta equals, you guys remember? No. It's been a while, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. So if we look at it, so if I remember it was opposite over hypotenuse, And then cosine was adjacent. Is it Sakatoa? Uh, something like that, Dr. Henry? Sakatoa? Yeah. I don't remember. It might be. Okay. So if this is point X, this is point Y, this is point uh, Z. So the sine would be opposite. So the opposite would be the length from X to Y times the hypotenuse, which is D, that distance from top to bottom. So sine theta is going to equal X y over d, okay? Which happens to be the same thing if we use z, so it'd be the same way, right? We know that um, the wavelength, so if we're looking at the wavelength, the wavelength would be the combination, so lambda, the wavelength would be the sum of the distance from x, y, z, right? So it'll be x, y plus y, z. Okay. So if we combine this equation and this equation, then we can get, oh, sorry. And uh, let's see, wavelength, lambda, it's gonna be equal to 2D sine, Okay, so if we use this equation or if we use 
get one more sign equals theta yz d. Okay. So if we do that, then we basically could use sine. Uh, we solve this for x y. And y z. And we end up with this. Because we plug this into this equation here. So we get lambda equals 2d, 2d uh, sine. Oops, sorry. D. You guys are just going to let me write that wrong? I mean, I don't remember much from high school, so. <laughs> OK, so then you're going to basically use this equation where the wavelength is going to be equal to 2 data uh, sine delta. I mean, wavelength is going to be 2d sine delta, OK? So this is known as, as Bragg's equation. And this is all of the, all that information. OK, so and how can I use this? OK, so if we know that Bragg's equation is lambda equals 2d sine theta. This is your angle. This is your wavelength. Can you calculate the distance between the two um, atoms? And since you're, you want to make sure that you use degrees and not radians, because if you use radians, it's going to give you the wrong answer. Okay. So what do you guys get? Solve for this for D. I'm going to change the color. Can you guys even see the blue? Is that better? Are you guys even there? Didn't even bother. Yeah. Okay.
Okay. So 3.3 3 times 10 to the minus 10. Questions, concerns, cash? I don't think so. Okay. That's chapter 10. It wasn't too bad, I guess. It wasn't too bad. Oh, we're not finished. We got to go to chapter oh. 11. Give me a second. <laughs> well, regarding chapter 10. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of it's conceptual. There's a few calculations, but not too much. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to be talking about is the dissolution process. And uh, we're going to talk about electrolytes briefly. And then we're going to finish that up with uh, solubility and polygonal properties. So, oops. can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So when we talk about solutions, solutions are not gonna always be liquids. Solutions could be uh, mixtures of gases as well. So we could have a solution of gas, we could have solutions of solids. So it's just the concept of um, solution being composed of a solute being dissolved in a solvent, okay? So in general terms, a solution is just a solute dissolved in a solvent. So solvent, is considered to be the most abundant, right? Of the products that are there, the solute are the least abundant, okay? So if not told otherwise, we're gonna often assume that the solvent is gonna be water, okay? But the solvent could be something else. They'll let you know what it is if it's something different. Okay. Okay. So soluble covalent solvents, um, they're going to be, they're going to exist as individual dispersion particles throughout the solutions. Okay. So, in other words, if we have water and let's say we have sugar, right? So basically we have sugar, mole uh, sugar molecules in that water and it's gonna be surrounded in that water. And that water is gonna kind of keep it in suspension. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, another example is methanol. Methanol is an alcohol, right? Methanol is a liquid and at room temperature and water is also a liquid at room temperature. So. If we add water to methanol, then we make it aqueous. We still have methanol, but it's aqueous. So what we're interested in is the solute, 
which is, in this case, the methanol. Okay? With me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we're talking about ionic compounds, the same concept happens. If the ions are soluble in water, then what happens is, is that we have our solid. In this case, this is, uh, what is this compound called? It's also written on the board. So potassium dichlorate, I mean dichromate, oops. So the potassium dichromate solid, if we add it to water, what happens? is initially it becomes aqueous, but over time it actually dissolves in water, breaking up into its ionic components. Two potassiums, ions, and one chromate ion. Okay, simple? Okay, so the energy that's involved in um, solvation. So basically the energy that's involved in making solutions solid, okay, or dissolving the solutions, okay? So if a solution formation requires a high enough energy threshold, a solution won't form. So you know how we talk about certain things not not break, not being dissolved in water, right? So we add it, um, we had talked about, I can't remember the chemical that we were, we were talking about. Somebody asked me, why do we put stuff in hydrate? And it's just to make it a little easier for us to dissolve it, right? Or why things are hydrated, right? Um, it's to make it easier to dissolve. So without that water, that energy is too high for it to just dissolve in solution normally. So it requires energy to be put into the system, okay? So if the solution is gonna form spontaneously, no energy is gonna be required. We're not putting anything into, the, into it, right? So that basically means that the threshold energy is so low that it's, it's, um, it's able to get over the hump without a driving force, okay? You don't need to put anything else into it, okay? And uh, this is going to kind of introduce us to that term entropy. Entropy is basically the order of a system, or it's the disorder of a system, to be exact. Um, low disorder uh, is basically highly organized, while high disorder is disorganized, okay, and random. Okay, so an energy that is going from a low entropy to a high entropy can be driven to solution formation. So it's gonna happen in that case more spontaneously. Okay, so let me give you an example. So barium hydroxide has a low solubility in water. Okay, so it's almost insoluble in water. Okay, the only way that we can get barium hydroxide to dissolve in water is by heating it up. Okay, so heating it up actually increases its solubility in water, okay, because we're putting energy into the system to kind of get it over that threshold. So we have uh, this energy threshold that we have to get over to get to that next point. Okay, so if the uh, the intermolecular forces um, are similar to a solvent, often we can neglect that uh, change in energy. It's not gonna require as much energy in that case, okay? So under these conditions, if the, if the um, intermolecular forces are similar, so that's gonna form spontaneous you're not gonna have to put energy in there, okay? So that's like in the case of methanol and water. It doesn't require any energy. Over time, it distributes 
it's easily incorporated because you have the hydrogen bonds in methanol and you also have hydrogen bonds in water. And so it utilizes that bonding. So you're not having to put anything in there. Okay, sodium hydroxide is highly soluble in water, right? This is also gonna be done spontaneously. So in this case, you're gonna get the spontaneous formation of the solution, and you're also gonna get energy released. So energy is gonna be released from the system, so it's gonna be exothermic. And this is gonna be a result of, of um, high entropy. And uh, so that's going to lead to that dissociation of the ions. The ions are going to just kind of go apart from each other because there's high disorder associated with that system. OK. Are you with me so far? Yep. OK. Now, ammonium nitrate and ammonium nitrate is normally used in coal packs. and. Uh, and so they basically result in uh, a temperature decrease. So basically they're taking energy from the system and putting it into the chemical reaction, okay? So in this situation, there's gonna be a, just a small amount of energy required for that solution to absorb from the atmosphere. Um, and so that entropy force isn't gonna be strong enough. Okay, and it's not going to be strong enough because it has to be absorbing from the atmosphere. You're going to have to take energy from the atmosphere to make it happen. Okay. So are you with me so far? Yes. Dr. Henry, I have a question. Yep. Um, so when you're talking about like high or low disorder, like what do you mean by that? Like stability or some or anything like that? Yeah, it has a little. It it is stability, but it's like it's okay. So um, in a sense, it's a combination of organization. So like, if we're forming crystalline structure, is it organized in that sense, or is it kind of random? Right. Um, it's that, and it's also stability in terms of the compound itself being stable in itself. So that that is all part of it. So entropy is a combination of a couple of things. It's the stability of the compound and also the order of the compound. Okay. It's their organization to it. It's, you know, so it, it it's a component of a couple of things. And so, um, and that's gonna be important for you to know because when we get to entropy, when we start talking about it directly, you'll start seeing there's a component that we take into consideration the stability of a compound. There's a part where we take it in consideration the order of the compound. And then there's also a part that we take into consideration any work that could be done by the compound. Okay. And all of that plays a part in it. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So we have electrolytes. So you guys know what electrolytes are, right? So I've heard of it. <laughs> you've, you've heard of it, right? Gatorade has electrolytes in it, right? And Powerades. <laughs> Powerade has electrolytes in it, right? Okay, so electrolytes in the most simplest term are anything that's able to conduct um, electricity, okay? And so now these solutions that are able to conduct, there are solutions that are able to conduct electricity, right? So these solutions basically have ions dissolved in them that will allow them to conduct electricity, okay? And so the ions are gonna be forming by dissociation, right, in, a, in water or in a solvent. So a strong electrolyte is gonna have a, almost 100% dissociation, right? And uh, so you're basically in solution, they're gonna break up into the ionic components completely. That's gonna be a strong electrolyte. A weak electrolyte isn't gonna break up 100%. So you're gonna have some form of it, right? So 
Weak electrolytes don't dissociate or associates very little. Strong electrolytes dissociates completely. So a solution that doesn't have any significant, um, that doesn't, is it able to conduct electricity is considered to be a non-electrolyte. Make sense? Doesn't conduct electricity, non-electrolyte, okay? So are you with me so far? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, the electrolytes work because you have the ion and you have, let's say, water, right? The waters are solvent. You have the ion in there. So you have, like, say, sodium chloride. So then we have the sodium ion. And we have our, chlor our chloride ion. And those guys are going to be surrounded by water. And you guys remember how they're surrounded? So why are they gonna orient this way? Why is the water molecule gonna orient a certain way? Uh, because the the dipoles. That's right. Because of the dipoles. Yep. Okay. Temple. Okay. So when we start talking about solubility, right? A large part of the solubility is using those um, intermolecular forces that we've talked about, right? So in this context, we're using the fact that we have a dipole ion intermolecular forces, force. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, solubility. Okay, so solubility of solutions are going to be, again, using those intermolecular forces to determine it. Now, when we talk about solubility, there's a whole thing that is described by tables, the solubility table, which I'm going to give you a very general form of it to kind of give you an idea of things that are going to be soluble and when things are going to be insoluble. And so you're going to be, be able to remember that. You need to be able to remember some of that, right? Um, we did talk about, like in chapter, I think it was chapter one, back in the old days, you actually have to remember um, if things were going to form precipitate or if they were going to be soluble right do you remember that yeah okay so that's coming back okay and um we're going to talk a little bit about um qualitative of uh, solutions so if it's saturated Saturated meaning that it has the most, the maximum solubility. Unsaturated means it, it doesn't have the max, maximum saturability. There's very little that's there. And then um, let's see. And then we have supersaturated. So we've basically exceeded the max. So we've done a condition that allow us to sit there and get beyond the maximum in there. Okay. So supersaturated, saturated, and unsaturated. And then we're going to talk about gas solubility. And then we're going to talk about my law, Henry's law. It's not my real law. I wish it was. I'd be rich. I charge everybody every time they use it. OK, so your solubility table. So if you go back into the chapter, we kind of went over this. And I have probably a nicer figure than just words. So ammonium compounds are going to always be soluble, always. Group one, group one uh, ions are always going to be soluble. Okay. Most acetates are soluble except 
when they're with aluminum and silver. So acetates are going to be soluble except when they're with aluminum and silver ions. Your perchlorates and your chlorates are always going to be soluble. Your nitrates, those all nitrates are soluble. Your nitrites are all going to be soluble except when it's with silver. Silver one. Your chlorides, your bromides, and your i um, your iodides are all going to be soluble except with silver uh, one, mercury one, and lead two. Uh, fluorides are going to be soluble except with magnesium, uh, calcium, uh, strontium, so basically group two, right? So group two, um, ions, and lead two. Your sulfates are all going to be soluble except with group two ions and silver, uh, mercury two, and lead two. Um, your sulfites are all going to be insoluble except for ammonium group one metals and, uh, and magnesium ion. Your carbonates are going to be almost all insoluble except for group one metals and ammonium. Your phosphates are going to all be insoluble except group one metals and ammonium. Your sulfides are going to be insoluble except for group one metals and uh, ammonium. Now, hydrogen sulfide or is going to be insoluble. Sorry, dihydrogen sulfide. Um, most of your hydroxides are going to be insoluble, except for when they're with group one metals, ammonium and barium. And we know that barium hydroxide takes a little bit of energy to get it to dissolve, some heat. We talked about that earlier. Most oxides are going to be insoluble. And then all of our acids are going to be considered soluble. Um, but the weak acids um, aren't going to dissociate enough to become um, the, their ionic compounds, but your strong acids will. Okay. And these are some examples of strong acids. And uh, most of your gases are considered to be insoluble, uh, such as hydrogen sulfide or hydrogen disulfide, or, sorry, dihydrogen sulfide. Um, methane, ammonia, oxygen. So the way that we calculate solubility um, of gases, we use Henry's law. Henry's law is just um, C, G, where C represents the concentrated the concentration of the gas uh, that's being dissolved, and uh, K would be a constant that is specific to that dissolved solute um, solution uh, system. And P is the partial pressure or the vapor pressure. Okay. So, how do we use Henry's law? Okay, so here, here's an example. Calculate the solubility of nitrogen gas in water. When the partial pressure of nitrogen above water, the vapor pressure of nitrogen is 1.10 atm at zero degrees Celsius. The solubility of nitrogen in water is 8.21 times 10 to the minus four molar at zero degrees Celsius with uh, a nitrogen pressure above water, uh, I'm sorry, with a nitrogen pressure 
uh, above water at 0 0.790 um, ATM. Okay, so what am I going to do? Make sure the units are the same, which I think they are ATM. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what is Henry's law? It was concentration of the gas is equal to a constant. times the partial pressure okay Okay, so what am I going to use in this case? So I'm given ATM. I want, I'm looking to calculate the solubility of nitrogen gas in water when the partial pressure of nitrogen is above, above water is 1.1 ATM. Now this gives me the the solubility of nitrogen in water is, that's the concentration at zero degrees with that pressure. So what am I gonna do in this circumstance? Can I change my equation? So, because K is a, a constant, right? And then I can say K is equal to um, CG. And I'm going to say just CG1 over, meaning the concentration of gas, which also serves as our solubility over the partial pressure, what? K is always gonna be a constant. So that's gonna be the same case in terms of CG2 and P and two. So I could just put these guys equal to each other and I can say CG one, equals CG two over PN two, this guy's over PN one. Can I say that? I think so, yeah. Okay, so then this guy would be my P one, my PN one. This guy would be my PN2. This guy would be my CG1. And then I'm looking for my CG2. Okay, so then what do I need to do now? Uh, plug in the numbers. Okay. So. I'm gonna just solve for CG2 first because that's what I'm looking for. Make my life a little bit easier. And then I'll plug in my numbers. Is that right, Selena? Yes. Okay, so we get CG2 is going to be equal to uh, PN2, which is 0 
ATM. Divided by 1.10 ATM times 8.21 times 10 to the minus 4 ATM. So I get Okay, and that's molar here. Okay. Piece of cake? Yeah, now that I know how to do it. Okay. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to be talking about is uh, uh, colligated properties. Colligated properties are just basically properties that are going to be due to dissolving um, solutes in solutions, right? So in this case, remember when you guys did the salt, that salt experiment? Yeah. Okay. So we should be able to sit there and calculate the, the freezing point and the melting point based upon the co colligated properties. So I'm gonna give you guys an example of that and how to go about doing that. But the first thing I need to introduce you to, reintroduce you guys to is molar fractions. We've talked about it before, but we're gonna talk about it again, okay? Um, or we're gonna to have to use molality, okay? Molality is, you guys remember the definition of molality? It it's been a while. Anyone? Molality. Okay. Molality is basically moles of solute over kilograms of solution. Okay. So mole fraction is going to be the moles of the partial. You'll say your solute divided by the moles of your solute plus your solvent. Okay, that's your mole fraction. Okay. Piece cake? I think so, yeah. yeah. Sorry. So the mole fractions of your of uh, and this should be actually, this should say X. XA should be plus XB should equal one. Instead of N. Okay. Molality is moles over solute divided by kilograms of solvent. Okay. So, 
we've talked about vapor pressure, right? So if we want to calculate uh, the vapor pressure of a solution, the way that we would do that is we would take the mole fraction of the solvent times the vapor pressure of the solvent, and then that's going to give us the new vapor pressure of the solution. Okay, simple. Yeah, no, maybe. Yeah, kind of, yeah. It's a real simple equation. P solution equals um, mole fraction of solvent times uh, uh, the vapor pressure of solution, of solvent, not solution. So vapor pressure of solution is just gonna be a, a fraction of that of the solvent, okay? Okay. Okay, so the vapor pressure of a solution contains 53.6 grams of glycerin dissolved in 133.7 grams of ethanol is 11, I mean, 113 uh, torr at 40 degrees Celsius. Calculate the, va the vapor pressure of pure ethanol at 40 degrees Celsius. Okay, so how am I gonna do this? So how do I calculate the X solvent? Okay, I'm done for today. I'll see you guys on Monday.